welcome. This is update for July 18, 2022, day 145 of the war and of the date update. <clears throat> As you can see, we're, we're going to start with this um, scandal, this, this, this whole situation in Ukraine, internal politics. And so the continuation of their uh, yesterday sort of resignation or attempt to fire you know, this uh, uh, two, pol uh, well, I guess, state uh, uh, service people. Uh, the the sort of the update is the following. So Ivan Bakanov, who is uh, head of uh, SBU, he just sort of left without any fight quietly. Uh, nobody heard him and nothing. Uh, at the same time, we uh, mentioned that the Rina Venediktova is... Uh, very good, uh, well, bureaucrat in terms of how to preserve herself in the power. And he, she has a extremely good knowledge of the judicial system and obviously some connections there and so on. So she decided to, uh, to fight. And um, basically, the president of Ukraine offered her to resign or asked her to resign. She responded no. And then she said, I'm, um, and effectively she said that uh, his uh, decree or, or like her, her firing is illegal, which is actually true. So now the president is kind of a little bit in a bind with this because the only way, and then she said the only way to, to fire me uh, is through the hearing in the parliament, which is controlled by Ukrainian president anyways. Uh, at the same time, the the control is probably not so not so strong at this point. Uh, so, so what uh, and if, and what happens there is, if there is a hearing in the parliament, there will be a lot of unpleasant and honest information disclosed about who's actually to blame for all of this. Because uh, for basically, she's kind of blamed right now for. A huge uh, number of uh, f uh, former government bureaucrats in the judicial system that basically uh, switch sides uh, in, in effectively uh, participating in uh, Russian occupational administration. So she doesn't obviously she doesn't want to be blamed for that, and to a large extent, uh, she's not the one to blame. This is really this whole system is really inherited from. From this, uh, from the Soviet Union, so it was always, you know, call it home. It's which is very, very unusual for any country. But in Ukraine, this whole governmental system was, from the very beginning until now, totally anti-Ukrainian. Um, most of the people who were uh, selected into it and who get selected in, into it are they usually have pro-Russian sentiment or connected to Russia or just outright uh, Russian agents. So it's in a way kind of like a Ukrainian version of deep state that is actually uh, Russian deep state, right? And so so when, uh, so when she said that, okay, well, we're going to have this hearing uh, in the parliament and I'm going to you know, report on everything and explain everything and so on. So... So she made this threat, and effectively, the whole attempt to fire her fell apart because president doesn't want to doesn't want her to go to parliament and speak in public and you know and and disclose all, all of their dirty laundry, which effectively will point towards him. And so now this whole thing kind of like died in a way, a little bit died out where uh, there. Uh, people in parliament, uh, they representatives in the parliament, they just say, okay, well, it was not the firing. It's actually just uh, she needs just to step, uh, you know, step away or take vacation or whatever you call it, so that uh, there could be fair um, investigation of what was happening there. So this is a sort of latest update on this whole situation, and it's still somewhat unclear the motivation for this whole firing for this in a way it looks like kind of like some kind of show uh, to basically reassign the blame to find scapegoats and to extend and this is obviously speculated right now it could have been triggered 
by the victorious parts accusations uh, of uh, Andrei Yermak and ask to fire him and so on. And this is kind of like, oh, we're just going to distract people's attention with sort of new different scandal. And here's the people who are responsible for a lot of Russian spies, traitors, agents, and so on. So it's not uh, uh, Yermak, it's just uh, different people. So this could be this kind of oppression. Obviously, it's all speculative, right? So, but knowing how this, you know, all of this dirty uh, politics, it, that that looks very plausible, let's put this way. Now let's uh, switch. Uh, an additional uh, comment that uh, um, I would like to make about Ukrainian economy again, just for those who haven't watched, Ukrainian economy is in, uh, in, is in totally, totally bad shape. And the people who making economic policies making things much, much, much worse than they could have been. And that really, if things are not corrected, will lead to some kind of economic collapse or disaster sometime in October, November time frame. Um, so this is just a kind of our assessment of their Ukrainian economic situation. Uh, now let's actually switch to uh, Russia. Uh, and so a few 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 uh, bits of information about uh, economy Russia. We, we're gonna focus on economy Russia because from our perspective, economy really drives your ability to wage the war and in essence it drives pretty much everything else, uh, including politics. So um, not otherwise uh, as many people think. Uh, so uh, Russia had a record, uh, trade surplus uh, from trading goods in June, which is uh, $30 billion. Uh, this is really, you know, blowing up any kind of numbers. It's um, probably most countries don't don't have that in, in just single months. Uh, obviously, this is uh, f due to export of crude oil, basically energy resources, mostly crude oil because natural gas is essentially export is blocked to Europe and let's actually uh, move here so most of the uh, export natural gas at this essentially close to dwindle to small stream essentially uh, from a huge uh, sort of uh, stream so the only other uh, taker of Russian uh, natural gas is still uh, China and to extend Japan from Sakhalin but uh, that's those are not major sources of income for Russia. Obviously, Europe was the biggest uh, taker of uh, Russian natural gas. So, uh, and then, uh, so all of it is coming from crude oil, which again proves the point that all of those sanctions are counterproductive and don't solve problem. Actually, they actually make it better for Russia because the price of crude stays high, so Russia can even reduce production and still earn the same money or even more money, right? So this is this is kind of like, a, again, completely misguided policies that actually, um, you know, help uh, Russia, but actually hurt the West in many ways. So, um, however, despite all of this wonderful results in terms of exporting uh, energy commodities, the situation in Russian economy is definitely deteriorating. We, dis we sort of explained that many times with specific facts. Uh, and then now let's look more like at macroeconomic level. So usually Russian budget is um, sort of profitable. So they uh, so it's not profitable. They don't then they don't use deficits uh, to fund the expenses, which is means that uh, the budget is run properly, conservatively, prudently, and so on. All sort of good things, right? And most, can, let's say 90, probably 8% of the countries don't do that way. They, they, they go into deficits, which create problems and down the road in the economy. So Russia was doing sort of right things for itself for probably whatever, 10, 12, 15 years, whatever it is. And then uh, this year now it's a deficit, right? So they basically, 
spend more than they than they earn in terms of Russian state budget. We're not talking about the sort of personal money and so on. This is just uh, uh, government money, right? That they collect uh, from the economy. So, so that's the first thing that things are getting out of balance, and that's really sign of the dying economy like real economy not just you know expert of crude oil but everything else what we discuss you know starting from making cars to making refrigerators to making glass to making whatever else uh, economy needs that consumers need so that's a sign of the dying economy first of all and now what the russian government decided to do so russia accumulated uh, huge or uh, Sort of reserves, effects reserves, or created huge savings. Basically, think of it as a huge savings account during the good times, right? It's called, uh, I think, fund of future generation, something like that. Many countries like sim that are similar in right to Russia position, they do the state run, uh, uh, state sort of run funds. So, for example, um, Norway is famous for for that fund. They have it as well. Uh, it's a, I think close to one trillion or something uh, US dollars. So it's a huge fund for the again future generations. Similar things are done in Persian Gulf, Gulf uh, by uh, Saudi Arabia and so on. So that's uh, not something new. But the point is, Russia had this fund, and now what they decided to do, they decided to dip into that fund to cover that budget deficits, right? So. They decided that they think could dip as much as half of that fund. So that also sign of sort of not good life and Russia starts to dip into its government of Russia starts to dip into its uh, savings by actually trying to use their sort of societal resources that were saved for the future, right? Because that's why it's called fund of future generations. Um, to sort of paint even more picture of their real economy so there was a poll of the uh, business sentiment of russian business and it fell to the lowest uh, level since their start of uh, since the beginning of uh, of its uh, records which not not terribly long 2009 but 2009 was obviously a bad year due to the uh, financial crash and so on so so it, it went down all the way there. So the situation in Russian account and probably, you know, even lower. So basically that's the lowest record, the lowest level on the record, right? So that also kind of tells you that the economy's real economy is not feeling good at all. And then there is another number about 113,000 Russian small and medium, medium businesses closed since the beginning of the war. So again, there what happens is it's kind of like a two worlds right one world of exporting energy commodities uh, which is done through uh, you know russian large corporations state-run corporations it's doing okay and specifically the crude part of it uh, natural gas is not doing that great obviously but the crude oil kind of like you know they doing great the rest of the economy, like real economy, small, small and medium businesses, they all suffering, dying, and you know, in agony essentially, right? So that's a situation uh, with the Russian economy, which again, that's also a sign that they going to some kind of like uh, negative event. Uh, it's unclear if they're gonna arrive to it sooner than Ukraine or later than Ukraine, but both countries, as we said many, many times, they're going to their own 1917 moments in their history. Uh, and then uh, on other news is that uh, China mentioned um, that they may support, step up and support Russia financially and actually even military-wise. So that's uh, super. That's kind of like a little, somewhat new development, uh, which does not surprise us because uh, there is extremely strong ties between Russia and China, as they they feel that they are in one boat eventually, effectively, right? So because we there are there is a Chinese TV channels that are on the 
on the front line in Ukraine on the side of uh, Russian army. So they basically reporting from the other side. There are some propaganda clips uh, from this war that were translated to Chinese language and aired on Chinese TV and they're extremely popular and so on. So, so the countries are anyways uh, sort of uh, tied uh, at the hip in many ways uh, in this whole situation. And as situation in Russia becomes uh, more difficult, more and more difficult, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise that China will decide to step in, especially given their situation with Taiwan, where they f- the, there is support for Taiwan from, from the US specifically and West in generally. So that's, that's kind of like the whole big picture of this war. So hopefully anyone who saw it before that this is some kind of regional war um, probably and get hopefully get disillusioned about this whole thing. Now let's move a little bit uh, to uh, Europe. What's going on there? Uh, so Europe uh, is consuming about 200 plus minus 200 um, billion uh, cubic meter of natural gas, which dwindled right now to very extremely low level because Nord Stream 1 is blocked because there, the pump there is being repaired and now finally being delivered. But then Russia is also saying that they may not deliver natural gas. So there's sort of that speculation there. So the Europe is trying to find natural gas for the upcoming winter wherever they can. And so far they actually uh, managed to find uh, 20 um, billion cubic meters from Azerbaijan. So uh, this is going to be probably going to go through Turkey and obviously, you know, to Europe. And that's obviously not going to be anywhere near enough because worst case scenario, you can lose all 200 uh, billion um, cubic meters. So far, it's probably lost close to 100. Uh, so the situation is difficult, uh, but this is not going to solve the problem. Uh, so the other c- country actually where there is resources, obviously Iran is one, but it's under sort of sanctions and so on. Uh, the other country that has a, a large natural gas resource is actually Turkmenistan. Mo- most people not aware of it. And it's probably because they all, these three countries somehow share one huge uh, deposit or resource. We don't know, obviously not geologists, but it does look like uh, they all have sort of similar uh, features in terms of they have, uh, you know, the Azerbaijan also has some uh, crude oil and uh, Iran has obviously crude and, uh, and natural gas. And then Turkmenistan has tons of natural gas. Uh, in the past, actually, Ukraine was buying directly from Turkmenistan until Russia actually monopolized this trade by if, because it goes through the Russian territory. So what it did, it essentially signed an agreement with Turkmenistan forcing Turkmenistan to sell natural gas to Russia. And then it resells it uh, to Ukraine and probably also to the West. So basically, the Russia was kind of like a gate uh, gatekeeper to prevent additional competition on their European market from this Central Asian country. Uh, well, I'm not sure if the if Kazakhstan has it uh, as well, but they more have uh, more uh, crude oil. But uh, for sure, Turkmenistan has uh, huge deposits of natural gas. So uh, as a result of all of this. Um, many European countries are opening up, they're switching their power station to uh, coal, which is a sensible decision, given this whole situation, specifically Germany announced that they're going to switch to coal, even though they say that this is a temporary decision and so on. It's probably, you know, as they say, everything is temporary is usually very permanent. So uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, but that's... uh, sensible decision giving this whole uh, situation in in the world and and so on now let's actually uh, switch and uh, let's look what's going on uh, at the front line so uh, we go oh we're gonna our well, first uh, quick update on on high mars system so the only attack that was sort of how say attributed to high mars system was attacked uh, towards this 
towards the dam here near Nova Kahovka here. This is big, this huge artificial lake. And there is a dam here that's being used also like a bridge to cross on both sides. So there was some attack in that area. It's unclear if it was successful or not, but that's the only attack so far that could be attributed to HIMARS system. As, as in general, we see clear decline in A, frequency of use, and B, in the success rate. We, uh, as someone in the comments said, like, you know, it's all speculative. Yeah, it's all speculative what the reasons for that, but the factual situation is, yes, it, uh, you know, the A, the use of it declined, and the success rate declined. So that's very... Uh, sort of straightforward and undisputable situation overall. Uh, so um, now let's actually start going uh, through the front line in in our typical clockwise clockwise fashion, starting from the very north and going then down south. So first of all, uh, this uh, area along the state uh, border. So we mentioned uh, yesterday about uh, governor of Kursk region saying that he doing some kind of operation on Ukrainian border so it looks like what it uh, turns out to be is basically uh, attack of Ukrainian side with um, multiple uh, rocket launching system so that's what what is all was about but essentially the exchange of all sort of at this point all sorts of fire artillery mortar uh, you know rocket everything goes uh, in this area at this point uh, the only thing that there is no sort of actual fights with the troops essentially using actual soldiers actual units that's the only thing that's still uh, not there uh, now let's move a little bit south to the area east of Kharkiv things here are totally positional totally on pause not, no real news here now uh, and then in terms of all of these units here uh, just another update on um, on this whole let's actually go back and look at this whole units here so you can see looks it could look impressive in terms of actual unit but as we discussed many many times in russia it's not the war right now right it's a special operation because it's special operation so everybody who serves in the unit has right to say no and not to go to ukraine basically he's not crossing the border and what we're seeing in Russian resources, more and more Russian soldiers choosing not to not to cross the border, right? Because there is not really much upside there. So what? So as a result, you know, on on the list, this this impressive list of units here. But what this really means that it's actually probably they probably trimmed down significantly in terms of actual fighting power because they basically you know trimmed down to like battle groups or consolidated units whatever you call it and and that's that's what's going on so we understand that right now russian russian army in ukraine is probably not more than 130,000 maybe even 150 at most and and that's why part of the reason why they they sort of on pause with the new offensive is for two reasons one main main reasons is the huge attrition in the past fighting and there is no replacement which what which what what we were saying starting from probably sometime in april right uh, that that the russian troops they need fresh manpower and there is not enough fresh manpower and there's no desire to do mobilization in russia so as a result they kind of you know the you know they sort of the ability to to fight is has diminished right and then the second sort of tool that russian army had was russian artillery which they would concentrate and then just create world war one type of uh, artillery barrage uh, and destroy everything inside that is also right now kind of like somewhat taking away not completely but the the potency of that tool has diminished quite a bit with the attacks against the ammunition depot so right now they sort of like 
or has have call it the ammunition hunger right uh, on starvation mode a little bit right so as a result so you have okay not enough troops on the ground plus what you used before was your artillery and now they don't have enough shells to shell at will and in huge numbers so as a result there is this kind of like natural pause in how the russian side is going to resolve it is to be seen we can all speculate for you know different ways how this can be resolved but the the situation is very clear they either need um, you know increased number of troops right which means mobilization or or and give more um, ammunition right or improve the log logistics of ammunition basically not even so much ammunition but, but logistics right so that also significant investment in in logistical sort of effort right so this is uh, this this are two main problems that russian side is trying to overcome and that's probably why russian minister of defense visited troops uh, in ukraine russian troops in ukraine about a day or two ago so apparently they were just you know discussing how to uh, to to get out of this corner because this very clear that there is no easy way out so you cannot just sort of fake it continue you know continue faking it uh, at this point you 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 hit the wall and you really need to throw more resources or double down uh, in your war and for that reason there is a lot of rational political top now is saying okay that this whole special operation does not have timeline it will last as long as it's needed and so on and then there's even lower level uh, a representative from russian occupational administration uh, he said that russian troops expect to capture the remainder of the donbass region by end of the year right so now the the goals and timeline becomes either sort of kind of call it indefinite or sometime in the distant future and that's because there is no clear strategy right now how to continue it understanding that there is lack of manpower and then lack of ammunition at this point and you really need to double down and and the russian political top doesn't really quite want to double down so that's kind of high level what's going on there then in terms of um, uh, there was also a lot of speculation that ukrainian army has sold uh, this uh, high, even like high mars system the caesar self-propelled hobbitzer m777 to russia it's all very primitive uh, russian propaganda because there is not even single picture to to prove that and, and obviously that that would not be the case because this this equipment is sort of like watched like a whole like a whole by everyone there are even like special uh, uh gps uh, installed on on some of them so so like for example on high mars units so you can track it so even probably you know uh, american command has uh, knowledge where they are and so on so it's it's definitely monitored like uh, like with a hawkeye and everybody would know if this happened and plus they are in the rear they are not um, very close to the front line with exception actually of those m triple seven that were the damaged one destroyed completely destroyed were captured by russian uh, troops in lysychansk so they were hit by russian artillery and so or russian um, airstrikes we don't know we don't remember for sure but anyway so they were too close and they got hit but the problem with those uh m triple seven actually harvesters they are not long range they are they as we mentioned before they are like for like with the russian art artillery so so you have to be somewhat close maybe not the close they were actually but you 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 definitely can be subject to russian uh counter uh, counter battery fire so that they are sort of not sort of immune and then there was another question about what's going on here and the, at this uh, area of the front line we don't really discuss much of it and so on essentially this uh this uh 
section of the front line is uh, quiet. It's only screening troops from both sides, as we discussed many times. Both, si both sides, they don't have enough manpower, enough troops to really sort of cover all of this long uh, front line, which is probably about 1500 kilometers, uh, maybe even more, plus minus, but it's really huge. So you really need to have um, a lot of manpower and neither side has that or let's say not willing to commit commit immediately that amount so as a result this is this area is essentially all just screening troops on both sides and nothing else and they both sides kind of like sort of in a way you, you agreed not to do anything there because they just don't have anything to 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 use here at the same time we mentioned this so uh, probably three months ago or something this is excellent area for opportunity for ukrainian side to create some kind of offensive that could have devastating effect on all of this uh, group russian group uh, here on the zoom bridgehead that essentially could encircle uh, and create disorderly withdrawal and 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 totally collapse the front line in this whole area and create opportunity to cap to re to re uh, to liberate this whole uh, Kharkiv region uh, unfortunately ukrainian side ukrainian army is not uh, skilled not taught doesn't have equipment doesn't have knowledge doesn't have proper command doesn't have good communication to execute offensives um, the best it can do at this point is some is actually static defense which is again also very primitive type of um how to say of warfare because the right the best thing in this in, in in the ukrainian situation is actually active defense which is you know moving attacking withdrawing so kind of like that's why it's called active right versus just what happens right now it's just statically holding uh, the ground no matter what and and um, and only with retreating under threat of encirclement so that's kind of like the most primitive less defi least efficient way of warfare but that's unfortunately the level of skills in the ukrainian army at this point so it you know you cannot jump over your head let's put it this way now let's actually move to um a zoom bridge head um so the situation here is more or less stable there was a new area of russian attack towards village dmitrivka again it, it it does all look like just probing uh, small scale attacks this is not not nothing really major here now let's look actually to, uh, at what's going on at uh, northern bus front line here things are um somewhat similar we would call it probing attacks or small scale attacks however they were all over this uh, this stretch from the river from Siversky Donetsk river to this uh, Ivana Darivka essentially it does look like uh, Russian troops are probing and trying to figure out where there are weaker spots in Ukrainian defenses here uh, to exploit that in the future when they're going to be pre be prepared for the major offensive or just executing uh, order from the min Russian Minister of Defense which we mentioned about two days ago who said like you know we need to put pressure attack Ukrainian side everywhere and so uh, Russian generals mindlessly executing on that order just trying to say oh yep check mark we, we are attacking uh, without uh, much sort of progress or even uh, chances of progress so this attacks uh, didn't lead to anywhere now let's look uh, let's move down uh, to the southern section of the same front line here the air, the only area where there were attacks is uh, this towards this we don't even know how to call it like you you know ukrainian peninsula here so the russian troops uh, as always attacking towards this power plant then they trying to cut off this or create a threat of cut off of, of this Ukrainian troops in the hope that they're gonna withdraw from here and then just more straightforward attack towards Novoluhansky. So this is a you know typical scenario, sort of call it broken record. So we're just seeing it every essentially um, you know every three days and so on. 
Um, now let's move um, let's move south. Let's see what's going on west of Donetsk. Situation here is a little bit getting a little bit more hotter, a little bit more intense. In terms of there is some action as opposed to before, they were totally quiet. So again, there are similar Russian attacks. Again, it's the same kind of broker record, the same pattern, uh, attacking in the same place, sort of probably thousand times. Is uh, this village coming? Because they, they essentially would, what the Russian troops want to do is to basically create a threat of encirclement of Avdiivka and force withdrawal of Ukrainian troops from Avdiivka, um, but without success. And then uh, the other area is this Nova Mikhailivka, where they would like to sort of cut this off, uh, this little salient around it, essentially, that's it. And then uh, the other area is uh, Vuhledar, where we do think that uh, Russian troops are, are probing and trying to figure out where the good area to attack, where it doesn't have strong Ukrainian defenses. And uh, it does feel like this area could be sort of potential candidate for that. Now let's move to uh, look what's going on at the Parisian front line. Things here are totally sort of call it quiet. The same situation, positional, static defense, just exchange of artillery fire, nothing new here. Now let's uh, look at the final stretch, which is Kherson. Um, bridgehead and things here again the same just positional defense exchange of artillery fire sort of small scale skirmishes but nothing really new okay thanks for watching and until tomorrow bye bye